Hey guys, Lunch Money Comics here. It's really early in the morning. I've actually tried filming this intro like five times, but I didn't have my coffee yet, and I just couldn't do it. So I have my coffee, so here we go. I'm heading to another flea market, and this one's sort of special to me. See, I'm out in eastern Massachusetts where I grew up, I'm visiting family, and I figured I would go to the flea market that I used to go to every Sunday, and where I sort of learned how to pick. And I have lots of friends here, uh, lots of sellers I've met over the years that I have a really good rapport with, and uh, I'm excited to see them. I'm also excited to see how this place has changed. It's literally been years since I've been here, so uh, I'm looking forward to it. I don't know if they have comic books. You know, I know they've had them in the past years ago, but you never know, so I'm eager to see what they have. Um, so why don't you come along and find out with me? Finally, comic books. I was getting worried I wasn't gonna find any. Okay. A lot of these are not in great shape, and a lot of them are non Marvel, non DC. Lots of Conan, lots of Tarzan. Yeah. Oh, good. All right. Thanks. Dollar a piece for all these. Oh, boy. All right. These aren't lunch money prices, but they're awesome. Whoa. Basically, every time you open them, it's like every time, yeah. Basically, I, I try to bring new stuff, so I try to grab, but I, it's like I can see the die cut. I bury that. Oh, but I'll try to bring some to Harry's. The problem is, I'm not going to be September soon, yeah. The end of September. There's some really cool stuff in here. Nice. I've never been to England. I mean, I've, I've, I did a stopover, but I've actually never. Now, if you go and make your own food. Yeah, I'm going to have to go through these a little bit more carefully. Oh, look. Some of these are just awesome. These tent centers. Goodness. Set up at. Do you do toy shows? You should do denim. When I go to, I go to denim a lot. Uh, right. I pay the extra to get it early. I do crazy at denim. The sticker price in these is fifty nine. What could you do?
So the whole box all together? Yep. What are you looking for? He wanted 200 on everything. 200 on everything? Yeah. Right, I, gotta go, I gotta go through it. Oh yeah, definitely. Feel free So you're definitely only selling this as a lot yeah. all together. You can't break it up. I don't want to break it up. Okay. Unless you make it worth my while, basically. Yeah, you know yeah. What I mean? Nope. No, that's... Yeah, no, I appreciate it, though. No, thank you. No, yeah. they just wanted to look at. I'll put the good ones on the top for the next person, all right? Okay. Yeah, so that guy was only selling the lot for $200 and would not budge, and there just wasn't enough there. Let's keep looking. Yep. Alright. So you've gone through them all, nothing too great. Um, I mean I don't really know comics that well. Okay. I just like the covers. That's a good reason to like comic books, honestly. Alright guys, I'm almost back to the car. Um pretty successful day. I got some really good comic books and uh probably more importantly I actually made some really good connections. You know, I introduce some people to the YouTube channel and you know they're gonna call me if they find anything comic related and likewise you know one guy was looking for video games and I see those so I'll let him know so these are the types of you know connections that can really pay off sometimes you might get that call that leads you to the honey hole so um, yeah I'll see you guys back at the house and I'll show you what I got so there you go guys another successful morning hunting for comic books at a flea market for me um, I hope you didn't mind that sort of bucolic country music I edited in. I had some serious issues with my brand new microphone. The levels were all messed up and I had to fill the dead air with something. That tune doesn't really fit sort of my, the theme of my picks, which were sort of, you know, monster comic books, but it definitely fits the theme of that flea market. That's Todd Farm Antique Flea Market in Rowley, Massachusetts. It's a beautiful flea market in a beautiful part of New England on a great road, lots of antique places, you know, salt marshes. It's close to Newburyport, Ipswich, Essex, Gloucester. If you're ever north of Boston or like southern New Hampshire or Maine and you're free on a Sunday, definitely check out Todd Farm Antique Flea Market. It's absolutely worth it. I'll put a link down in the description to its website. Definitely encourage everybody to check it out if you're in the area. So I ended up with a pretty good stack of comic books and, um, it's a really eclectic mix of things. I sort of stepped outside of my comfort zone of collecting, which I think is definitely a good thing to do every once in a while. You know, not only does it broaden your horizons and, you know, make your collection more diversified, but it also teaches you a lot. And I learned a lot about the comic books I got and the research that I did afterwards to sort of learn about them. So I'll go through them. I'm going to start sort of like I usually do with the uh, sort of more common comic books. So here we go. I have a couple of uh, easy ones here. These were like a buck each or a couple dollars each. Just uh, The Uncanny X-Men number 225 and Uncanny X-Men number 217. I just don't have these ones. These are Chris Claremont run X-Men and uh, these will go back into my X-Men collection. Nothing much to say there. Um, I also got this one, Iron Man number 229. This is part of the Armor Wars, the first Armor Wars storyline. We know the Armor Wars show was coming to Disney Plus and this one's cool. It has Iron Man battling Titanium Man and the Crimson Dynamo. Very cool. All right, next up is three comic books in the same series. Um, this is... Mephisto versus X Factor. This is number two in the story. Mephisto versus the X Men, number three. Mephisto versus the Avengers, number four. I already have these. Actually, I have all four of the ones that belong here. Why did I get this story again? Well, because this gentleman did not have number one, but the very last pick I did, I found number one, but not two, three, four. So um, it was worth me getting the whole set. It's sort of a silly story. It's written by Al Milgram. I think uh, John Buscema did the art. It's a really bad plan by Mephisto to sort of like trade up souls to get Thor or something like that. But um, yeah, it's got a really cool art and I'm happy to have a collection like this that I got pretty darn cheap. I want to add something really quick. I accidentally in my last video was talking really fast and I think I said Steve Buscema. I think I was thinking of Steve Buscemi. Um, 
whatever, you make mistakes. So I apologize to any uh, John Buscema fans that are out there. Next up, we have Captain America number 310. Those of you who have, been, who have been watching my channel saw me pull this out of a collection not that long ago. This is the first appearance of the Serpent Society, sort of an a evil team of snake-themed bad guys. And this is the first appearance of a whole bunch of them. Now, they're sort of dumb. I, you know, they're not a really great team, but I still like this book. And the reason is, whenever I see, like, sort of dumb villains or I see, you know, especially supervillain teams, I always think they're really good picks to sort of sprinkle into the MCU, right? They're an easy foil for some good guys to fight or to show up in a Disney Plus show. We recently saw it in She-Hulk with a version of the Wrecking Crew. I feel like Serpent Society fits that bill. Always good to have, sort of a minor spec buy. Okay, so the next one is for all the DC fans out there. This is Detective Comics number 489. This is from 1980. This has a, it's a really thick comic book. It has six all new thrilling stories in it. You can kind of see them all written down the side here. Um, really cool cover. The reason why this one jumped out to me is that normally when you have these kind of larger king size comic books, it's hard to find them in good condition. They tend to get beat up. But this one's uh, beautiful. It's in great shape. I doubt it was ever read. And uh, it just had a really cool cover. And um, I had to have it. So all these comic books I just showed you, um, I got from the same vendor, and um, he was uh, happy enough to give me his card after I picked these out. So I have one more connection that I got there, and he let me know like I can contact him if I'm looking for especially collectibles in the 50s, 60s, 70s, but he also has lots of comic books, and he said he had a lot more that he didn't bring. So again, always great to have these connections, guys. So this brings me to my biggest buy of the day. It was actually the first comic book vendor that I found there, as you saw in the footage. He had a whole bunch of $1 books that I couldn't find anything of value. But then I went over to his nice boxes and he had lots of really old gold and silver age monster books, sci-fi books, ones based on television shows. Really interesting. He also had lots of like magazines, you know, like monster magazines. And there were some other guys picking through those sort of horror books. But for me, you know, I had access to this comic box and, uh, and this gentleman sort of lamented. He said for two weeks straight previous to this, he brought all his Marvel and DC good stuff and nobody looked through them. So he didn't bring them this time. And of course now he had me looking for them, but I wanted to check out what was in there. Now this is definitely outside of my comfort zone. I don't have many of these old monster books. I'm not that really interested in them, but I love the aesthetic of them. And I know a lot of them can be worth money. So I essentially went through this box and I picked out the ones that I thought looked great to me that were also at a good price. So I'm actually going to lead with my favorite comic book that I got out of this batch. And it's also the oldest and the most expensive one I bought. This is My Greatest Adventure number 52. It's a DC comic from 1961. It's a 10 cent comic. And the story here is I became the sun creature. You see the sun creature right on the front here. I don't know what it was about this book, but I just absolutely had to have it. Um, this cover is fantastic, right? You have the, the sun monster on the front. You have this really cool green trade dress. And this is art by Dick Dillon, I think is who it was. And um, it was just awesome. I just thought this was a really good looking book. Um, it's pretty beat up. There's some spine wear and the staples kind of pulled a bit. And the guy was able to come down quite a bit when I pointed out the issues. But in general, I mean, I just love the look of this book. I would like to know what you guys think. This is a pretty cool book to have in your collection. Definitely outside my comfort zone, but I'm happy to have it. So now I'm going to go into the early 70s to show you the rest of these books. The first one here is Monsters on the Prowl number 10. This is from 1971. It has a really cool Steve Ditko cover. And um, most of these monster books from the early 70s were actually, the stories were reprints of older stories. So the story in here is, was originally in uh, Journey into Mystery number 71. The reason why I like this one, it was a good price, but also, you know, Right here, they're talking about The Rock, you know, ROC, you know, the fictional giant bird. And that's what I presume is hatching out of this giant egg. But I liked it because I'm a Dungeons and Dragons fan and it looked a lot like an owl bear to me. Any other Dungeons and Dragons fans out there? Let me know what you think. I think it's a giant owl bear. I'm sticking with it. So the next two comic books I got are from a series called Where Monsters Dwell. I got two of them. I got number 33 and number one. So just like Monsters on the Prowl, these are reprints of older stories. This one's actually a reprint of uh, a Monsters on the Prowl story from years before. And why this one jumped out to me, this number 33, is because it was done by Al Milgram, and you can see he signed his name right there on the train car. Pretty cool. But this one here, number one, I got because it's the number one in a series, but unbeknownst to me, this is also has some a pretty high pedigree for the cover art. So this cover was done by Jack Kirby, Steve Ditko, and John Romita. It's crazy, right? So 
some pretty big names there. It's a 15 center from 1970. I thought it was pretty cool to have these. And um, yeah, again, reprinted stories, but brand new covers. I was sort of uh, fascinated to find out afterwards that there are two books in the series that actually fetch a pretty high premium. They are actually reprints of the first appearance of Groot in the first cover appearance of Fin Fang Foom. I didn't see either of those in the collection, but uh, before you sort of disregard this series as just being some early 70s reprinted fluff, remember that there are a couple of issues worth looking at, and they are number 6 and 21. Keep your eye out for them, guys. Okay, so the last three books we have are from Journey Into Mystery. But don't get too excited, it's from Volume 2. Volume 2 first came out in 1972, and I got three of them. I'll talk to them in reverse order here. Um, this is number 17. This is from 1975. It's a reproduction of Journey into Mystery number 21 as a story by, you know, Stan Lee, Jack Kirby Art. Uh, very cool. And um, this one's just in really good shape. It was probably in the best shape of any books I saw in there, uh, at least in this line. It has something called like the Unhumans, these like creepy aliens you can see through their skin. I just thought it was cool and it's in really great shape. The next one I have is Journey into Mystery number 13. This one here is from 1974. It's a reprint of Strange Worlds number one. Also Stan Lee and Jack Kirby. And has a really cool cover of like an abominable snowman on the attack. Just great color on this one. It really popped. Um, again, really decent price for it. Very happy to have it. Which brings me to my last comic book of this haul. This is Journey into Mystery number one, volume two. Now, this book had a little bit of a price tag on it, but it was the first issue in a volume, so I really wanted to have it. It's not in the best shape. Someone sort of wrote on the cover, but um, I thought it was pretty cool. I actually opened it up and read the first story. Now, I say first story because this one's a little bit different than the other ones, where those were reprints of older comic stories. This has three different stories. The second and third story seem to be unique, but the first story is actually very interesting. It's actually a comic book adaptation of Dig Me No Grave, which is a short story by Robert E. Howard from 1937. Now, for those of you who know who Robert E. Howard is, he actually was someone who wrote a lot of horror novels in the Cthulhu Lovecraftian mythos. It actually falls into the Lovecraft um, canon. So the first story in here is a short story by him or a comic adaptation of that older story. So I thought that was pretty cool. I like Lovecraft type stuff, so I definitely read it. Now, this comic book has two sort of minor keys or, or things that are very interesting to talk about. One of them I did find online, I saw immediately, and um, it's sort of a stretch. And the second one, I actually read it and I started to ask myself some questions and did some research. So bear with me here, two really strange sort of key identifiers in this. Let's talk about sort of the easy one first. The third story in this um, has a personification of death, like the angel of death as a cosmic being, a cosmic being that could take on any form and is basically death personified. No big deal, except the person who drew that third story, Jim Starlin, who would go on to the year after this came out, this came out in 1972, in 1973, he created the Marvel version of death as a cosmic entity. So in many ways, you can say this is Jim Starlin's first depiction of the Marvel uh, version of death. Like I said, it's sort of a stretch, but it's kind of cool. Now, the other sort of amazing thing I found in this book was in the first story, that adaptation of that old 1937 horror story. Um, in this story that's in this book, there's a guy who's doing like some incantations. And because this is, you know, Lovecraftian Cthulhu madness, you know, he's conjuring or invoking the names of all these like, you know, deep ones and dark ones and all these sort of like alien interdimensional horrible beasts. And he calls out a name of Shuma Garath. Most of you, I think, have heard of Shuma Garath. It's He's a tentacled, one-eyed villain that's usually going up against Doctor Strange. The latest Doctor Strange movie had Gargantos, who they couldn't use Shuma Garath for some rights reasons. But basically, picture Gargantos, but much smarter, much more evil. Um, that's essentially what Shuma Garath is. Now, I read that and I thought it was really strange because I thought Shuma Garath, Marvel Shuma Garath, was later. So I looked it up. Sure enough, Robert E. Howard actually came up with the name Shuma Garath in 1937. So they reprinted it, his name's in here. That name goes on to inspire the Marvel Shuma Garath the year after this came out. So, again, it's a stretch, bear with me. This comic book right here is the first mention of the name Shuma Garath in a Marvel title. I might be wrong, 
but I'm going with it. I read it, I did the research, and um, I'm pretty sure that's right. Uh, let me know down in the comments if I'm making that up, if these two sort of uh, pseudo keys are even worth, uh, you know, the $10 I spent on this or not. I think it's pretty cool. First Jim Starlin death, first mention of Shu McGrath, number one in a volume. I'm happy to have it. So all told from this gentleman, I got seven old 60s and 70s Silver Age monster books for $45. I'm pretty happy with these. Like I said, I don't know much about these sort of old monster books, but I love the aesthetic on them. I loved how, how they look. Uh, I might put a couple on the wall behind me. They're just really interesting. And the more research I did on them afterwards, the more I like them. There's just such a high pedigree of writers and artists in these books, despite the fact that they're reprinted stories. I think they're definitely worth having. I'm pretty excited to have them. Let me know down in the comments if you thought I got a good deal on these, or if these are things that like you are interested in. I'd love to hear from any of the horror, monster fans, sci-fi fans out there, if these are definitely worth having in your collection. So all told, I end up with uh, 16, 17 comic books here um, that I got for a total of $60. So I think I had a pretty good um, you know, hour and a half at the flea market. I really like some of the stuff I got. Again, nothing really too big or crazy, just interesting things that have broadened my comic collecting horizons. So there you go. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you like what you saw, please hit the like button and consider subscribing. I have so much really good content coming out soon, including footage from Brimfield Flea Market, one of the largest flea markets in the country. So in the meantime, this has been Lunch Money Comics. I hope you guys find strange and unusual comics in strange and unusual places, and I'll see you next time at the flea markets.